I'm so glad to be back at my church. This is a, a place I call home uh, ever since 1991 uh, in the first Gulf War. It was Reverend George Regas that uh, opened the hearts of All Saints Church to people seeking peace. Uh, and then Reverend Ed Bacon, and now uh, very, very proud to stand alongside uh, the rector of All Saints, uh, Reverend Mike Kinman, who has been, uh, please give him a hand, who's, who's been con continuing this legacy uh, with grace and with intelligence and with great leadership. Um, I'm going to get right to the speakers because we came to, to listen to them. Um, and as Mike said, we need to listen to different narratives. And there's some things you will hear today that you may not agree with. Uh, there's some things that um, you will maybe even find uh, a lot of differences of opinion uh, throughout the world. The, the main point is that this is unheard in America. It is unseen. It is even unwritten. Uh, it is not in our history textbooks. The history textbooks call this the Dark Ages, uh, and that's because Europe was going through the Dark Ages uh, while um, Islam was leading the civilization. And so to understand relations with Christians and Jews as part of Islamic civilization is important. And when I say Islamic civilization, it's not necessarily a religious issue. It's not theological necessarily, although it has theological underpinnings, but it is mainly the social understanding and the political authority between the 8th and 19th centuries. And to understand uh, the dynamics of that, I think will help us uh, as peacemakers, will help us understand these dual narratives, maybe even more than two narratives, as we approach uh, the issue of the Middle East that has been uh, troubling us for quite some time. So with that, let me just get right to our, our first uh, panelist. Um, he is uh, Munir Sheikh. He's the vice president of Bayan College which produces a lot of chaplains uh, that are trained here in America, not trained in the Middle East, but having that American Muslim understanding, identity, and orientation. And he's also a professor of history, and he he's going to cover the early Islamic history on Jerusalem and Palestine. Good day, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you to MPAC and All Saints Church for hosting this gathering. I'm going to try to provide you a summary of uh, Islamic history and the relationship that Muslims have with the, the region of Palestine in 15 minutes, <laughs> which, you know, should take no less than three hours in actuality if this were, you know, in a university uh, classroom. Uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, I've also uh, shared a QR code and link for those of you who'd like to pull up the slides for future reference uh, in case it's of interest to you. But uh, uh, really hoping to provide you a little bit of a framework from an academic standpoint, but also uh, an Islamic perspective on uh, the history of the region since the time of the rise of, the, uh, of, us, of Islam. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the, the prophet, the last prophet in the Islamic tradition is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who was born in 570 CE and was called to a mission to preach uh, monotheism starting in 610. And it was a 22, 23 year journey that he went through in advocating for people in Arabia, particularly to come back to the, the roots of their faith tradition, which was monotheism, the roots that are represented by the structure of the Kaaba that you see here on the slide. Uh, the mountain that you see in the, in the image is the, the location of the very first revelation that took place when the angel Gabriel, according to Islamic tradition, came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and announced to him that he was going to be given this mission of uh, transmitting the word of God and bringing people back in a more sort of universal framework uh, to a religion uh, of worshiping of the one God. And there are many aspects of his life. Uh, we won't you know, go through all of the d details of uh, his experiences uh, as a prophet, uh, but there are certain key uh, developments that took place in his lifetime that relate to uh, the area of Palestine and the, the location of Jerusalem in particular. In 619 CE, for example, he had an experience called the night journey. And we can move to the second slide and I'll 
say a bit about that. Um, so in the Islamic tradition, this is known as a miraculous event that took place within one night. In a single night in 619, the prophet was taken on a, on a steed, essentially a winged steed that is known as Burak in the Islamic tradition to a location that the Quran describes as the farthest mosque. So the mosque that's uh, uh, the original house of worship according to Islamic tradition would be the Kaaba, which you saw on the previous slide. That house is believed to have been constructed by Abraham and his son Ismail. So that is kind of the uh, original house and then, or the original mosque or place of worship and the farthest mosque from their perspective in Arabia was the mosque or the location, the holy site in Jerusalem, which is also referred to as Al-Quds in, in Arabic. So that location of the farthest, the farthest mosque is the Aqsa Mosque, and hence uh, the name given to that mosque subsequently as it was constructed in the early Islamic empire. So in the time that Muhammad was preaching, for a good portion of that time, the Muslim community around him in Mecca and then even in Medina, once they moved there, they prayed facing Jerusalem. So they had this sense of a, a connection to that land and a connection to the story of Abraham and the, uh, the other prophets that are predecessors of the prophet Muhammad and the site of Jerusalem being very special and holy. At that time, the Mecca had been, uh, the, the Kaaba in Mecca had uh, hundreds of deities that the, the Arab tribes had brought to the Kaaba and housed there, and they were performing pilgr pilgrimages there on an annual basis. So later on, towards the end of the prophet's life, he was able to return to Mecca, and he was able to clear out all of those deities and idols, and then rededicate the Kaaba as the house of the one God, or Allah in Arabic. So while this was still transpiring, the early Muslim community actually were, were praying in the direction of Jerusalem. I think that's worth noting. Um, and also in relation to this event, the Isra and Miraj, the prophet uh, is believed to have led all of the other prophets, essentially in spirit, in prayer. Uh, and this is again part of the sacred history of Islam that positions the prophet Muhammad as the final prophet, as the seal of the prophets, but also as a, a brother of all of the other prophets. In his own words, Muhammad describes himself as the final brick that goes into the edifice or the wall of prophethood. So it's not that the prophet Muhammad is purely distinct and elevated relative to the other prophets, but the Quran even indicates to Muslims, to the believers that all of the prophets are essentially uh, uh, brothers to one another and committed to the same ultimate mission. We'll move on to the next slide. The Prophet Muhammad passed away in 632 CE uh, after that mission of 22 or 23 years. And he was succeeded in uh, leadership of the community, not as a prophetic figure, but as a responsible steward of the community by a number of his companions. And this is the list of the first four stewards or caliphs, as they're called, uh, successors of the prophet uh, who led the community through various challenges that they faced as a, as a fledgling polity in Medina. Uh, Abu Bakr, who was a companion of the prophet and one of the early supporters of, of him in Mecca, uh, became the first of these caliphs. He was selected by a council of Meccan and Medinan Muslims, uh, tribal leaders, as that successor. And he faced some challenges uh, within the community, some people who wanted to break away and no longer pay the zakat tax and other things. And he basically kept the community together. And then uh, after his passing away in two years, he was succeeded by another very important companion of the prophet named Umar, who was from a, 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 a family that was uh, honored in, in Mecca uh, along with some of the other families. And uh, during his time, the Muslim community uh, expanded the control of territory. Uh, they fought various forces of the Byzantines and the Sassanid Persians, and they defeated them in various battles. And they were steadily able to take control of parts of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Iraq, and, and so forth. So the Muslim community based in Medina was now 
sort of transforming itself into an, an empire of sorts. There was, there were, they were a religious community, but at the same time they were uh, gaining worldly authority over various subject populations. And this process continued under the other two caliphs. While this was happening, there were a variety of internal conflicts as well. We can't delve into that, but it's important to know that over time, uh, the Muslims continued to take control of formerly Byzantine and Sasanid territories. So this marked the end of the Persian dynasty or the Persian, uh, uh, Persian Empire and then the Byzantine Empire, uh, much of their territory, especially Syria and Palestine was taken over by the Muslims. Jerusalem itself was conquered in 638 by, uh, by Muslim forces and I'll speak to that in a moment in a little bit more detail, but you can see in the next slide the, the extent of the Muslim empire in the time of the third caliph, Uthman. Uh, so again, you can see the, the shaded area is the extent of the empire, which is quite significant. Again, uh, the taking over the uh, regions of Iran and uh, further east that the Sasanids had controlled and much of North Africa. Uh, and. So these became provinces of the fledgling Muslim empire, different regions that were governed by appointed governors, uh, and you know, they were expected to uh, maintain the systems that were already in place uh, within the society at large under the Byzantines and the Sasanids, which was the agricultural base, right? The Muslim uh, policy at the time of these early caliphs was to be as minimally disruptive as possible to the, um, agricultural and uh, uh, mercantile systems that were already in place. So while Muslim control is extending across these lands, the people who are living there remain Zoroastrian, remain Christian, remain Jewish, and so forth. Um, they were not expected to convert to Islam. In fact, the, the Umayyad dynasty, which I'll speak to in a moment, uh, did not prefer conversion. They preferred that the subject populations would continue to obviously pay, pay a poll tax, which was helpful for the empire, uh, but they did not expect that all of the population would convert to Islam. That was not something that they had as a, as a priority. Their interest, of course, was to maintain stability and control of those regions, uh, but they definitely did not uh, in any sort of uh, policy, uh, you know, expect that the local populations would convert. In fact, it took about 300 years since the time of the death of the prophet, 300 years from that before even 50% of the population of these regions had converted to Islam through intermarriage or through, you know, a desire for, uh, uh, you know, the appeal of the message of Islam or you know, relationships that they would have with various people to become part of, you know, the social structure of the, the, uh, the Muslim empire. Uh, let me say a bit more about uh, the arrival of Omar, the second caliph, to Jerusalem. So some of you may know this, uh, this story is uh, recorded in a variety of historical sources that were produced uh, by Muslim historians. And it's also uh, supported by a number of external sources from uh, some of the uh, Syriac Christian uh, histories of the time. Uh, when the Muslim uh, armed forces reached Jerusalem, they obviously surrounded the city. The bishop or the, the patriarch of uh, Jerusalem said that he would in fact surrender the city. You know, they weren't going to fight against uh, the Muslim forces. They were going to go ahead and uh, surrender the city, but he insisted that the caliph, he would only surrender the city to the, the leader of the Muslims, whoever that might be, the caliph, in other words. So Umar, who was in Medina at the time, actually had to make a journey of several weeks in order to come to Jerusalem and receive the keys to the city from the bishop or the patriarch uh, before they would be formally uh, allowed to enter the city. So the Muslim forces were camped outside of the city. They waited for Omar and he uh, ultimately walked into the city and was invited by the patriarch, in fact, to make a prayer in the church of the Holy Sepulchre there. And Omar famously declined to do so because he was very cognizant of the fact that he might be inadvertently setting a precedent where you know Muslims could just kind of go and 
pray wherever they wanted to, disregarding sort of the property rights of the subject population. So he was careful not to do that, and he insisted on praying outside of the church. And then later on, uh, he and his companions, they, you know, surveying the city, they located the site of the the place where Muhammad had uh, had that experience of ascending uh, from from the holy site, which is also considered to be the site where the temples used to used to be. Uh, the the, Jew, the second Jewish temple had been destroyed in 70 CE by the Romans. For the I'm sure many of you know this history, and so since from 70 until 638, uh, that site became uh, fell into disuse. And in fact, you know, a lot of time the, the trash from the city ended up sort of getting deposited there as just a site that was, you know, no longer being utilized and because it had been destroyed. And so Umar ordered that that site be cleansed because they wanted to rededicate it, re-sanctify it as a holy place. And so they cleared out all of the detritus that had accumulated there and they made it a place of worship. So they wanted to restore its function as a holy site, as a place of worship, which in the Islamic tradition, it's called the, the house, the holy house, or the Bayt, Bayt al-Maqdis. So this is a kind of, you know, imagine a concentric circle. You know, from an Islamic perspective, Islam is kind of the outer concentric circle, but within that is, you know, the, the traditions of the prior prophets, the tradition of uh, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, the traditions of Moses and Abraham and others, and their connection to that site. So Muslims feel at that time that they're doing something honorable by restoring its position as a holy site. Not so much as a statement of appropriation, but as a statement of let's make this site what it's meant to be, which is a, a channel or a connection to God. So that's, that's part of Umar's story in arriving at Jerusalem. He also makes a proclamation, a, an assurance um, to the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And that assurance you can read in, in detail. I'll read it really quickly. He says, of course, he starts in the name of God. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of God, Umar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Ailea, which is what Jerusalem had been called. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. Neither they nor their land on which they stand, nor their cross, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted. And Jews will not live in Ailea with them. The people of Jerusalem must pay the taxes like the people of other cities and must, must expel the Byzantines and the robbers. And it goes on from there. Uh, the important thing to note here is it's an assurance that Omar is giving specifically to the Christian leaders of the city. So he's speaking to them because at that time it was essentially predominantly a, a city inhabited by Christians because Jews had been dispersed after the destruction of the temple. They were allowed to come periodically for certain um, feast days or holidays in, in their tradition, but generally the city was predominantly a Christian city at the time of the Muslim conquest. So in this assurance, Umar is speaking to the Christians. He's saying that the, the Christians should not expect that the Muslims will require when they were going to permit Jews to be able to come back into the city, but they would not require them to be living amidst the Christian community. Because in this time, in the Middle Ages, you know, people tended to want to live with their own type of people, right? The, they didn't have a sense of integrating different groups of people. So that was part of the assurance. But subsequently, and we can move on to the next slide, with regard to the Muslim policy towards uh, non-Muslims, there's a concept in the Quran called Ahl al-Kitab, which is people of the book, so Jews and Christians and others eventually within Islamic law were considered people of the book. And the people of the book and other populations that might come under Muslim rule are known as people of the pact. People who, if they agreed to join the pact or agreed to the terms of the pact, they would be treated as subject populations with rights to maintain their properties, to maintain their religious traditions, to have uh, freedom of movement, uh, and, and no um, in interference with their customs, uh, their established customs. So 
Today, sometimes, you know, uh, amongst the alt-right, uh, the, the, the term vimmi is used as kind of a, uh, a kind of pejorative term and, you know, it's mischaracterized. But in, in the Middle Ages, this is actually quite remarkable because in the Byzantine world, you were supposed to be a Christian of the type that the Byzantines favored. Whatever the Byzantine emperor, whatever uh, flavor of Christianity at the time that he favored, the subjects were expected to adhere to that. Similarly, in the Sassanid Empire, you, you had to be Zoroastrian. If you were not, then if you were Persian and not Zoroastrian, then you could be persecuted. So there was this emphasis on the, the ruler and the population sharing the same faith tradition. In the Muslim Empire, because of certain principles within the Quran and certain practices that were established by Muhammad and the early caliphs, there wasn't a particular concern that the subject population must also practice Islam. Now, they were invited to do so by preachers and others, but they, it was not a governmental policy that they should do so. And hence, this structure of the Ahl al came about. And uh, instead of paying poll taxes to the Byzantines of the Sassanids, yes, these subject populations paid poll taxes that were assessed uh, uh, upon them as part of the agreement. Um, so I'm going to just conclude here with uh, uh, the last slide, which will lead into the next presenter. We won't talk about the Umayyad dynasty, which uh, came about after the first four caliphs, uh, but um, we can move on to the next slide. This is an image of the Dome of the Rock, which was built in the Umayyad period. The Umayyads were the first dynasty of uh, rulers in Islam a family rule, essentially, and they were later uh, displaced by the Abbasids. But the Umayyads built this structure as a place to honor the site of the sacred rock where Muhammad is believed to have ascended to heaven during that miraculous event, and also in some traditions where Abraham had sacrificed his son or attempted to sacrifice his son in fulfillment of God's command, and, uh, which was you know, um, prevented by a miraculous substitution. Um, we can continue. And this is a broader picture, again, you can look it up in your slides, of the precincts where the Dome of the Rock is structured as, and as, as well as the Al-Aqsa Mosque that was built on the bottom edge of that um, complex. And uh, the last slide, I think, after this. So there were a number of ruling dynasties that came about thereafter, of course, during the Crusades. Uh, Crusaders, uh, for a period of time of about 90 years, controlled the city of Jerusalem. Salah al-Din, who was a famous Muslim Kurdish ruler, displaced uh, the Crusaders, defeated them in a battle, and uh, was able to re regain control of the city. Uh, and then since that point, essentially, various other dynasties continued to rule Jerusalem all the way until the Ottoman conquest of Syria and Palestine in 1517 and uh, until the 20th century, essentially, the Ottomans controlled the city. So uh, I'll leave it at that and um, uh, thank you again for your attention.